Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that, or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question. Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenilee Samuel. Hi, and welcome, you guys, back to Java with Jen. Today, I have an exciting guest. This is my sister, and her name is Crystal Lott, and she is in the acting industry. And so I thought it would be great to have a show with her. I know lots of you guys may have questions about acting, and I don't know about you, but I've always been a little fascinated, like, what goes into an actor's life? We see them all over headlines, and, you know, is it really as glamorous as it seems? So today, she's going to share some insider scoop on what it's like to be in the acting world, the glam side, and the nitty-gritty of the back stories that you don't always get to see, as as well as at the end, stay tuned, we will have life hacks with Crystal, and she's going to share some little tips and tricks that she has found that make her life easier um, as a single woman in LA or as an actress or just whatever. She's got some little nuggets of gold saved for the end, so listen all the way to the end to catch those. So this is Crystal Law. Let's give her a round of applause. Yay! Hi, Crystal. <laughs> okay, so Crystal, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little background of maybe some of your experience in the acting world. You live in LA, so yeah. tell us a little about yourself. All right. Well, I moved out to LA in 2007. It's just been trying, like pursuing, you working a regular job and trying to get the audition and get the call back and get the role. Okay. So you say working a regular job. What is your regular job? My regular job is a sign language interpreter at a high school and a college. Okay. How long have you been doing that? Oh, I've been doing that for decade <laughs> or, so, or so yeah since 2004 I believe wow yeah. okay so now is it normal for people who go out there to act to have a secondary job oh absolutely everybody has jobs that can be flexible because you never know when you're gonna be like hey you have an audition tomorrow or you have an audition in three hours what so finding a job that can be flexible with that and not fire you is awesome. Yeah, that's probably a challenge, too. It is. A lot of waiters. Yeah, and especially probably one that makes enough money to survive in L.A. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers out there. Oh. DoorDash. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. We should have saved those for life hacks. Hey, if you need to survive in L.A., here's some jobs that'll get you through the grind. Give us your highlight reel. What are some of the things you've been in that has rounded out your acting experience to date? Okay, I've done Trouble Creek on YouTube, and that was my first role as a leading lady. And uh, also, I worked as a producer for Tactical Girl. Oh, so, see, I didn't even know that. Yep. What is Tactical Girl about? <laughs> That's the one that we just recently did. Um, it was It's kind of a spoof off a tombstone. How did you get into acting in the first place? It's obviously a big field. It's mm -hmm. obviously kind of cutthroat, or mm -hmm. so it seems from things I've heard. So how did you get into acting? I was kind of a roundabout way. I was in college trying to just get my basic AA and found myself in an interpreting program for sign language. And I was such a nervous wreck. I would get in front of the class, a huge class of 12, <laughs> and break down and cry just from nerves. I could not hold it together. So the director of the program told me, if you want to graduate from this, you have to take an acting class. And I freaked out because I was taking way too many credits plus working. I couldn't do it. And so I melted down and cried again. My tear ducts were clean that semester. Aww. Yes. <laughs> and uh, she said, okay, well, then the next best bet is to audition for the play that's coming up. Wow. So I said, just audition? She said, just audition. We didn't expect me to get the, the part. Mm -hmm. So I got the part, but I thought I just had to audition. And I, when I walked off that stage, I said, thank God I never have to do that again. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and Fam last, Famous last words. <laughs> Well, she saw the sheet that I had gotten offered the part, and she goes, congratulations, you got the role. And I'm like, yeah, but you just said I had to audition. I did my part. She's mm -hmm. like, no, now you have to honor that. 
And I was like, oh, Lord. what? <laughs> so after that experience, um, a flea in her ear was my first, it was the stepping stone that helped me conquer my fears of being in front of people and got me into the acting. Okay, so I totally had no idea. That's how you mm-hmm. practically got into acting. Yeah. I thought it went all the way back to high school because I knew you were in plays and stuff. I did a play in high school, uh, but again, I was such a nervous wreck and I was the understudy and I forgot my two lines, both oh, of yeah. them. And the girl is she the had next to say from the stage, from the side stage, <laughs> the, right? Yeah, the, uh, the lady, the girl who was my quote assistant um, in the play, told me my lines. Oh. <laughs> she was fanning her little fan and just kind of spoke behind the fan and told me the line. Oh, I was bless like, your heart! I was so embarrassed. I had the opening line of the first and the second act. Really? <laughs> oh, okay. So I never wanted to get back on stage. <laughs> okay, so that's crazy that deaf interpreting was your doorway into acting. The like, big one. like I was always drawn to acting and performance sure. and had a fascination with it, but mm-hmm. terrified of it. Terrified? Why terrified? terrified. Uh, just people watching me? What? I have to do what? I memorize? No, I'm forgetting my name as we speak right now. Wow. So, yeah. You know what that's so interesting, though? Now that you say that, when I was younger, I was horrified of speaking in front of people. Hmm. And yet that's the thing that I'm like called to do and now mm-hmm. like gifted at and stuff. And yet I was terrified. Like I remember sitting in front of a group of three to four people mortified that anybody <laughs> could hear my voice. You know what I mean? And I'm, it was just awful. So that's a little nugget for all you listeners. If there's something that has always been one of your greatest fears, potentially it will become your greatest asset one day. Did you always know that acting was something you wanted to do? And what, what was it specifically that fueled your passion for acting slash the people in the acting industry? When I was a little girl, apparently my heart was for it. I mean, mom just recently told me that even when I was just little, I, I always wanted to be an actress or a model and, um, and even had a heart for the people and the extent that these people need to know that they're loved and they're just human too. And we put mm-hmm. them on pedestals and there's no way that people can survive with that type of pressure constantly. They have to be seen as humans as well. And they they feel sadness and they feel emptiness. And a lot of times we judge them because they get on drugs or, you know, they're such a bad example Mm. or, but we don't know the story behind their pain. Yeah. And... So I've I always, since I was a little kid, I just, it started with Michael Jackson. He was uh-huh. my first one that I, <laughs> I would always pray for Michael Jackson. And, um, I, I don't know if that affected his life at all. I can only believe that it did to some sure. extent. And, yeah. uh, yeah, that's, I remember, I'm going to tell your story now. Oh, um, <laughs> we were talking about this a couple days ago. Uh, I remember when she was, mm, I imagine you were like in junior high. I feel like maybe, maybe high school. Maybe it was, it was a freshman. School. I think it was a freshman. Okay, so yeah. somewhere right between there. Anyways, we were in, in our house, and Mom and Dad were making some, maybe it was the news, something came on TV, something was said that was really critical of a celebrity. And um, my parents were making the comments. Crystal um, just kind of like had a meltdown and kind of <laughs> chewed out my parents, <laughs> which did. did not happen much in our house. Um, but you she did kinda, not do that in our no, house. No, <laughs> she, but she was tears a mess, and she was like, they are just people. Why don't you guys, we're here on the missions field saving people. They are people too, and they need Jesus too. And what is wrong, and why is everyone blah, blah, blah. So she just went on and on, <laughs> and I was kind of like eyes like saucers, like holy crap, did she just talk to mom and dad like that? But at the same time, we could all hear her passion and her compassion and her brokenness for this group of people through her passionate moment. Mom and dad responded really well. And my mom they handled was like, it very well. Yeah, they did. <laughs> and my mom was like, wow, Crystal, I had no idea you felt like this, but you're right. They are people. And I'm so proud of you, honey, to have such a heart for them. And so they totally handled it well. And that shifted the way we talked about celebrities <laughs> in our house. And, uh, and it, it honestly, for me too, shifted the way I looked at them because you're right. Like in our culture, people who are famous, it's like we, it's like our culture thinks you don't have to treat them human anymore because now they're an object Mm -hmm. instead of a person. And like the criticism, the lies, the scandals, the, the finger pointing and accusation and judgment that they endure is so unfair. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do that to a next door neighbor. Why would you do that to a celebrity? And they just handle so much criticism and scrutiny. Mm-hmm. And and because there's so many critics and because of their influence, it's probably harder to know who they can trust as friends. Mm-hmm. And so it's probably harder to find safe friends. And so then you deal with loneliness on top of all that pressure. So, yeah. I yeah, I totally, it, that was kind of life-changing for me. 
to see that experience. Given all of that, um, how does your faith factor then into your acting experience and the fact that you've been around actors? I mean, you were a roommate with someone who was Angelina Jolie's stand-in double for Mm -hmm. a few movies. You've been around people of influence. So how does your faith play into your -hmm. your experiences as an actress? I think the faith aspect is... If you get yourself grounded, it just gives you a mindset that can see them with compassion or you can hear more what's going on. Instead of seeing the actions that are straight in front of you and taking it as black and white, you can almost get a tap into the underlining or a possible underlining issue. And it just gives you a little bit more grace to deal with them as a human. What about even... Uh, when it comes to like roles that you'll consider or not consider, mm. this is always a sticky thing um, because there are, there are some roles that um, I'll do that <laughs> even my own family does not agree with. <laughs> um, but that's just the nature of it. It comes down to simply you and your own walk with the Lord, and where do you feel that you're getting the green light? Go ahead, because yeah. there might be some things further down the pike that you don't know about. You know, even if it's a role that seems absolutely fine on the surface, there might be something in the future that's not okay. And so you always just have to stay tuned in and be like, okay, Lord, is this where you want me or not? Yeah. No, it's, it's, I've heard other people in the acting industry who are believers say the same thing, that they just have to really each time kind of listen to the Lord on, on if it's going to be okay for them. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Tell us then practically, what is a day of filming like? Like, (laughs) we see what shows up on the TV screen. I've been able to witness some behind the scenes with you and Mm -hmm. and being audience members on on TV shows and stuff, sitcoms. Um, So what is the everyday filming like? Is it glorious? Um, There's aspects of it that are absolutely glorious. Uh, (laughs) And there are other days. This is a sit and wait, like hurry up and wait is what they Uh, call it uh because you have to... You know, you go to makeup and you get your hair and and your face done and then um, you go to set and you have your script with you. You can go over lines and you wait and you wait and you wait some more. (laughs) While they're tweaking lighting or something? Oh my goodness, whether it's be setting up lighting, moving to a different location or, you know, getting it from a different angle. (laughs) There's a lot of um, technical stuff that... The actor simply waits to be done. Uh. You know, the people who I think get the biggest kudos are all the crew. They mm. bust their booty the entire day. It's exhausting work for them. I'm just yeah. like, bravo. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did I answer that question? I'm, I'm sorry. Even I'm sure. just getting lost in what you're saying. I'm imagining it all. Yeah. I'm like picturing all the people scrambling and, and the they lights. They do. It's exactly and... what it is too. And then, and then, um, can okay, I tell us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I was on Trouble Creek, uh, found on YouTube. <laughs> I'm saying, go watch it. It's on YouTube. Uh, there was, there was the set or, or the, the waiting area. I forget what you call it. Um, the, I call it the waiting area where we was getting hair and makeup. Each set is different as far mm-hmm. as like if you have a trailer or if you have a room which mm-hmm. is craft services, hair and makeup, and waiting, uh-huh. it, and the restroom. It could be all squished together or it could be separate. It has, you know, sometimes you have a trailer for um, what they call the honey wagon, which is the porta potties basically. Oh, why do the they call trailer. it the honey wagon? I don't know why they call it the honey wagon. Like, should we Google that? <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> You got the honey wagon trailer, you have the craft services area, Um, sometimes they're together, sometimes they're separate, but on this day, my very first day on a legit union project, uh, (laughs) it was about, I don't know, about 20 feet apart from where you waited to where we were shooting to escort me to set. Oh, yes. And I was just like, it's right there. And they're like... I'll show you. And I was like, okay. And okay. I just had to follow them because that's just the protocol on, and you, you are escorted to set. And they announce you when you arrive on set, too. Ooh. I was just like, <laughs> did you feel like a queen? I, just, I felt really awkward. Like, I, I was sweating bad. <laughs> what about, like, the producers, the directors? Now, mm-hmm. I've had the, the fun of being able to, like, be in, uh, like, an audience member in a couple. We saw The State of Georgia, and we saw, what's the other one we saw? Yeah, the live sitcom. Yeah. What yeah, was with, her name? Um, Kirsty. Christy, Christy Alley? Hot in Cleveland. Oh, we didn't go to Hot in Cleveland. I wanted to. I went to Hot in Cleveland. You did. Were you not there with me? No, and I wanted to. They weren't filming. I was like, no. I used to watch Hot in Cleveland. Betty White wasn't there that day. She was (laughs) signing books at Costco. Oh, fancy. (laughs) Okay, so no, we went, we did 30-minute show, Mm -hmm. and we were there for like 8 to 10 hours. (laughs) It was a long day. It was so long (laughs) because they would like film the episode 
or sorry, the scene, they'd mm-hmm. film it at least three times, and they would, I'm sure they were changing camera angles or props or hair and they whatever. They had multi-cameras going on. They had like two to three cameras filming at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then us as the audience, you know, we had to like stay hyped up and stay like, Woo! You know, like laughing and all the things. So for you behind the scenes, there's producers, there's directors, there's actors. Who else is going on? Because I feel like there's a lot of little busybodies running there's, around. There's crew, there's gaffers, there's... Uh, Wait, what? They get tape when you need to spike a, a spot for you to stand for focusing. Because uh-huh. you have to hit... The, when you're walking, you have to hit the right spot. Otherwise, you'll be out of focus for the camera. Because oh. they set up the focus first, and then you do the scene, and you have to walk to, the, to your correct spot. Oh, and that's probably where the stand-in doubles come in. Mm-hmm. That Maybe they'll stand there to test lighting and focus Mm -hmm. while the actor is getting ready. While the actor's getting ready or if they're going over notes with the director or if they're finishing at another spot and they're being transported to the second location. It's to kind of get things set up so that when the actor is there, boom, you can just roll. Who is your acting inspiration? Mm, Jennifer Garner. Oh, I know. Did I have to think about that? All right. No, that's okay. Someday she and I are going to go out for tea. I just know it. We're going to go out for tea. It's a small town, L.A. Jennifer Garner, if you're listening, (laughs) she wants a date with you, (laughs) as well as the other 12 million people that are listening. Okay. (laughs) So, Jennifer Garner, why do you like her? She has this innocence about her that makes her your next-door neighbor. Uh You just instantly trust her. There's a genuinity, is that a word, or genuineness genuineness Uh about her. And I just find her completely endearing. Not only that, but she's got some acting chops. She can be the goofy, she can play the young, goofy, innocent girl from like 13 going on 30. Love that movie. To an alias, where Uh she gets to play all kinds of different characters. And that role was physically demanding for her as far as like fighting and combat. And accents. She had to do accents, oh. you know, and that's not something that you can just whip out. They're like, hey, by the way, next week you're Russian. What? Oh. Do what? YouTube. <laughs> How do I talk Russian? How do I make this sound honest? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's true. <laughs> so that was an intense role and she just did it with such grace and believability. She just has a, has a shine about her. And I think yeah. I get the sense that she has a beautiful heart. And she cares about people. Yeah, I've always kind of felt like that from even when I've seen her characters, even though her characters are diverse, something you're right, there is something very genuine and authentic and kind Mm -hmm. about her. And I appreciate that. I was going to go back to speaking of, you know, her likability and her kindness. Mm -hmm. I have heard producers and directors reference in like, you know, interviews on movies and stuff, um, how certain actors are really... Um, agreeable, easy to get along with. But then you've also seen ones like, um, well, I won't name people, but different ones where they've lost their role in a series, a movie series, um, because they were cocky, arrogant, and said things they shouldn't have said, you know, or just carried themselves in a way that was grievous to the people working around them. And I think it's important, like, even as a pastor, like, the people that are going to serve in the departments underneath us at the church, like, we look for people who are going to be faithful in the small things, who are going to have a good attitude, who are going to be flexible, who are going to be problem solvers, you know. And I imagine that even in acting, those kind of attributes matter. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Absolutely. The thing that I've been told by people is that you're different. You, um, servant is is the word I've gotten. I mean, granted, I was picking up their plate from craft services and throwing away <laughs> their trash for them. So, um, <laughs> I'm a mama. Well, what that's can very I do? anti. That's anti diva. So that's probably <laughs> refreshing. What was your most embarrassing moment on set? Oh, good golly. Okay. So, I'm going to use <laughs> Trouble Creek because that is that is my main jam right there. <laughs> On Trouble Creek, I was doing a scene with the fabulous Jason Gedrick. He is a sweetheart and a half. Um, he was, I, I think, uh, Iron Eagle, if any of you guys are of the older generation, Iron Eagle would be a movie that he was in, um, or Backdraft. He was the fireman that got burnt up. Oh. Yeah. He's a cutie booty. Anyway. Oh, he's a cutie booty. He's a cutie booty, yes. Um, He plays the sheriff on Trouble Creek, and he is my fiancé. And... (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So, this is my first time. um, He's... he's the celebrity on the set, and I was so nervous. And this is the first time... This is my second day on set, but the first time to be mic'd. Oh. Um, Was it the first time to be mic'd? Maybe it wasn't. 
I don't I don't even remember. I just remember being crazy nervous Aww. and knowing that they were everybody was under pressure because they had to race to the next location. So mm-hmm. I had to like crank out these scenes. Crystal <laughs> Crystal was the lead lady for this one. And I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't remember my lines. Uh, I kept messing up because nerves, nerves, nerves. I'm like, wait, now I have to move and say my lines and and speak. And is my microphone getting lost in my cleavage or <laughs> is it muff? Like I'm thinking all these things instead oh, of being present yeah. in the moment. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're standing there saying our lines. We're in the middle of the scene. And I'm thinking, it's like stage. You can't stop. You have to keep going. And I just got quiet. And it was my turn to say something. And I almost started crying. I just looked at Jason. My eyeballs got really big like saucers. And I went, ah. <laughs> I just kind of squeaked. <laughs> what did and, he then, do? and then the director, he was just kind of looking at me like he understood. But he there was no way he could prompt me from what my line was. Yeah. And so then finally the director had pity on me. Cut. <laughs> Comes over. And um, she's like, we thought it was a dramatic pause, but then it got very long. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> and she's like, you know, you can call for line, right? And I was like, <gasps> I can call for line? Aww. <laughs> and she's like, yes, I didn't know. You didn't know this. I was like, no, I was thinking a stage. You had to get it right in the take. <laughs> Aww. Wait, how do they do that? If you call for a line, doesn't that mean they've got to, like, edit the scene and stuff? Well, that's the magic with film is um, you're always editing. That's pretty cool. <laughs> because you might have an amazing scene that was perfectly lit and, and just the actors were on point and way off in the background, somebody decided to use their weed whacker. I like my garage like, door. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, or hold for the plane. There's a plane flying overhead oh. or, or somebody's car alarm goes off or all these Golly. different things that can mess it up. Or, That's so annoying. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. So. Okay, um, that, <laughs> that is so that, embarrassing. That is that is really embarrassing. I could totally see that because I just held forever and then I, I just wanted to cry. I was like, "Time's ticking. They have to go. I'm so in trouble. They're Aww. gonna fire me." <laughs> What's been your greatest disappointment and your greatest victory in acting? Because it's a journey. And yeah. so, what are your two? Maybe your your best and your worst. <laughs> okay, I would um, say the worst is just the disappointment that comes from waiting so long or hoping for an audition or it'll go a year, a year and a half without even having a single invite to audition. Mm -hmm. Like it's discouraging. Why am I out here? Yeah. Um, And I was at that point with, I'm sorry, I keep bringing up Trouble Creek, but that was, that was such a pivotal role for me. It was a turning point for me because it kept me in LA. Yeah. I was on my way out. I was Mm -hmm. ready to leave LA and go back to Arizona. And that, that, yeah. And just getting that role, that was the victory for me yeah. because it was, it was that thing that it was that project that was able to check off all the boxes on my, why I moved to LA list. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. it provided red carpet interviews. I've been on the screen, um, all over the U S with the mm-hmm. film festivals. Yeah. And, um, Grandma was my hot date Aww. at the red carpet. She's she's now passed away. So that was my last um, big moment with grandmas that she got to come into the studio and see me on the big screen. And that was yeah. always a dream of mine. Oh, that's yeah. so special. I didn't realize that. <laughs> I remember her being dressed up for it, but I, I yeah. didn't see all those pieces together. Well, yeah. and I love that because um, I do remember, and this kind of goes back to how your faith plays in. You've shared with me some moments where... You were like, okay, Lord, like, I felt like you called me out here and I've got nothing on the radar. I remember. And you mm-hmm. tell the story because she had set a deadline, put kind of a fleece out for the Lord and tell them how the Lord responded to your fleece moment. So this was 2016 and it was uh, January, February, some, I can't say that much. I got an audition. I felt like it was, I felt like I was perfect for the role and, um, and just, almost like a possessiveness about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I got the call back, which was fantastic, I had two callbacks. And um, and then when I got offered the role, I happened to be with mom and dad because I was, we, mom and dad and I were going on a camping trip and I was like, all right, if I don't hear back about this project, by the time I get back, then we're just going to pack up my stuff and I'm going to continue on to home to Arizona with mom and dad. I need confirmation that I'm still supposed to be out here because I'm tired and I'm done Mm -hmm. and there's been no ground. So I need something to tell me yes, to still stay out here that it's not, 
a waste of time. It was a day we were leaving. We're, we were at Walmart getting, I think, bottles of water and some snacks on the way out of town. And then I got the email in the parking lot. Oh, my <laughs> and gosh. And so I got the email, and I screamed, and then Mom screamed, and then Dad just started jumping up and down. He's like, why are we screaming? <laughs> <laughs> and Mom goes, Ellen, she got it. And she's Aww. like, did she say that? No, but she's screaming. You know she did. Aww. <laughs> Moms know. Moms just know. know. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't you love when the Lord waits to the very last possible second? No, I don't love it. <laughs> oh my gosh, Lord, why do you do this to me? Mm-hmm. Even though in that moment she said, I've had no traction and made no progress, whatever, whatever. That's what the feelings were saying. Uh, she had had a lot of experiences, learned a lot of things, taken a number of classes, had a number of exposures and done some projects and stuff. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't the, it, there was no breakthrough moment. Mm-hmm. And I think that, They were enough to kind of keep the hope alive. But, you know, like the word says, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I think Mm -hmm. your heart had grown kind of sick because the hope was alive, but it wasn't enough to make you feel like we're getting somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that moment was, like, I remember about Trouble Creek, even though it wasn't some major production that's like a sitcom on national, whatever, whatever, like, it was still such, it carried so much promise. It was Mm -hmm. like a promise of what's to come kind of thing. It seemed like it was more like a seed of the future. And it just, it came with so many confirmations Mm -hmm. of things that had been in your heart and even lies the enemy had spoken to you and insecurities and fears that you carried of Mm -hmm. like, maybe I'll never be a lead lady. And then you get this thing where you're a lead lady, you Mm -hmm. know, or maybe I'll never this. And then this thing happens. And so I remember that being such a I don't know, it was a game changer for you. It was definitely a project that healed my heart. And the people I met were just priceless. I love them all dearly. Oh, I know. <laughs> I see that the camaraderie of people working on projects together. Okay, so what what piece of advice would you leave to listeners? And this kind of segues into our life hacks. So that we'll, we'll, we'll smash this pieces of advice with life hacks with Crystal right now. Okay, smashing them together. If you are aspiring to be an actress, I definitely recommend finding a class that you can get plugged into. Um, and if you if you can't afford classes because they are expensive, uh-huh. I'm not going to lie, they are expensive. You still need to be doing something, whether that be volunteering or um, with a theater troupe somewhere, get plugged in there. What are the most important things to have if someone wants to get into the acting industry? What are the most, what are the essentials they have to have in place to be able to start submitting for things? <laughs> Headshot and resume. Headshot and Because a demo reel will come as you book projects and get your footage if you do student films. Get your footage from them. <clears throat> oh, like Because they don't pay. So your, your, your footage is your payment. Make sure you have good lighting. So nowadays, there's so many mm. eco casting, which means you videotape yourself at home and you send, submit it, oh. um, whether that be voiceover or video. Uh, so make sure that you have a microphone. Um, and if you're videotaping yourself, make sure you have a solid backdrop. Do not use your crazy background. Um, and it's distracting. It's, it's distracting. They want to just see you. Mm. I mean, some people have gotten away with it, like done an actual footage of here's me walking and saying my lines and I'm interacting and look at the background but sometimes it can get distracting too sometimes I just want to see you yeah so that's the best bet solid background good lighting get one of those rings Mm -hmm. and practice have somebody that you can have read with you and have your reader read silenter so that their voice is not the prominent voice on your recording Mm -hmm. when when you're submitting a video because your voice needs to be the one they hear even if they hear in the background that's okay they just need to hear you deliver your lines okay constantly find ways to one read a script read a cereal box Read a cereal box to where, especially if you're training for commercials, mm. to where you can look at the cereal box and then deliver the line. Like, pick up the information. Nutrition facts. Calories are 150 calories. You know, like, uh-huh. whatever. Serving size is two-thirds cup. Uh-huh. So you can Make look at something and pick the words up off the paper. That is mm. a skill to be able to glance and grab real fast and deliver to wherever you're supposed to deliver the line. Mm. Um, and read scripts, whether it be stage plays or children's uh, storybooks if you're interested in voice over a cartoon mm. you grab a kid's book i love going to the library and invading the kids section and just taking home stacks of kids books and reading it with character voices uh. play 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 get out of your head get out of your way and play yeah <laughs> that, it seems like that's one of the biggest things i hear too like when i see little snapshots of actors in like training classes or whatever they're mm. always like you got to shake off your inhibition 
we can be our own biggest obstacle, our fear of failure, our insecurity, mm-hmm. our like unsure, unsureness of ourselves, questioning ourselves, always second guessing or comparing ourselves to other people that makes Yeesh. us yes. feel like we're insufficient. <laughs> like we are our greatest obstacle so mm-hmm. many times. And I like you said this a few times where you're like, just do something. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that was the message that I kept getting. I think the Lord was throwing it at me because it was everywhere I looked when it came to creating my podcast, like just do something. Take a step forward. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because you learn as you go. Mm -hmm. And then when people like what you start with, then it only gets better from there, Mm -hmm. you know? So they get to kind of grow with you as you grow through the process of learning and forming. And so... Because here's the thing is it's art and art is always changing Mm -hmm. and always transforming. Whether you be a painter or a sculptor or a podcast person, a musician or a performer or sound engineer, you're always learning new things and your skills are not going to be the same 10 years from now. Yeah. So there's no perfect way to do it. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are right ways to do it because you, you know, you mess up with things or whatever, but that doesn't mean that a mistake is wrong. That mm-hmm. means you are learning. Yeah. Truth be told, like I know, for example, when I'm styling people, um, Times when uh, when my stats go down, like they're like, hey, you're not nailing my style or hey, these things aren't fitting right. It used to terrify me to see my <laughs> stats drop like, oh, my gosh, I'm failing at my job, you know. <laughs> but then when I realized like in those moments, I would I would dig deep. I would really dig into their feedback, try to figure out where I was missing it. And then my stats would go stronger. And mm-hmm. I realized after a few times of that, I realized, oh, well, when I start getting bad feedback, it, I always come out a stronger stylist and feel like more of an expert on the other side. And so like you're saying, like those mistakes aren't bad. And if we view them as bad, then we're totally missing the whole point. We learn through the struggle. And so I love, I love that you're sharing that with these guys because it's so true. Okay, so then what about an agent? Is that important? Um, it is, but you're before you get an agent, most times you need to have a demo reel. <laughs> oh really? Me. So having tools to present to agents, being like, "Hey, look, this is what I've done." Mm. Um, so mm. agents that aren't as well known might be more open to the newbies. Um, so okay. submit towards them. But again, you need to have headshots and resume. And if you don't, um, they'll tell you during the interview, "Okay, you need headshots, and we need to beef up your resume." Okay. So now, how does someone have a resume if they're a newbie? If you're a newbie, um, start taking classes, go to workshops, and put that on your resume. Uh List your special skills, your abilities. Can you make a taco tongue? Can you ride a unicycle? Like, what are your odd, (laughs) eccentric little (laughs) talents and skills that are hidden um, that you can put it on an actor's resume? (laughs) Okay, yes, which actually makes a really fun point. I'll post, okay, I took a little video footage of me and Crystal talking, so you get kind of feel like you were here with us in the room. I'm going to put it on the blog. I'm going to post some other photos, but Crystal, as an actor, is Uh-oh. really good. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Really good at coming up with those creative things that beef up your resume. So okay. she has done some of the most random, interesting, bizarre, why the heck are you doing this kind of things, <clears throat> like like wanting a unicycle and a harmonica for her birthday one year. Um, she got into, she did, she almost was on a female wrestling show. Was it the women's? Yeah. WW. W-O-W, W-O-W, wow. Super yes. Heroes. So she went mm-hmm. to training for that and almost killed herself. And then, <laughs> um, so she's like, forget that. Let's be a mermaid instead. So she now is in mermaiding, which every time I go to California to visit, <laughs> I get to share part in her cool new adventures. So now I have been transformed into a mermaid <laughs> and my sons are like, I want to be a merman. One particular, he really is actually really good at it. And so he really wants to do it. Anyways, so what are some, we'll end with this. What are some of your <laughs> random things? that you've learned to beef up your resume. Oh my gosh. Well, that's just special skills. (laughs) So you really want to beef up your resume with projects that you do. But the random skills, um, taco tongue. Can you hula hoop? Can you fire juggle? Can you, I can't, um, but can you? you? Hula dance. Like what, what? What can you do? Well, Crystal, thank you for yeah. being on my show today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so proud of my sister. Oh, well, I'm so <laughs> proud of my sister. Thank you so much. And I hope this was helpful for any of you listeners. Um, if you guys have any interest in getting into acting, reach out to Crystal. You can find her on Instagram at Chris, C-R-Y-S dot lovebird. Lovebird, because she has a lovebird, and that's why. You'll see it in her picture. Um, But she does lots of deaf interpreting videos. So if you see deaf interpreting videos, you've got the right person. 
<laughs> her name is Crystal Lott. You could probably search your name on Instagram too, right? It'll probably. find you. I think so. I think. Yeah, because I think I usually type that in. I'm so bad with social media. <laughs> she know. is kind of bad with social media. I'm trying to help her out with that. <laughs> but uh, do they have an email address? Would you um, like to give an email address? Or, or? Sure. It's Lott, L-O-T-T underscore crystal at yahoo.com. Okay, there we go. So if you have any questions you want to reach out to Crystal, you can do that. Find her at, at chris.lovebird um, on Instagram. You can also follow me on Instagram, generally Samuel Styling. And, um, and I like to throw stuff on there, like fashion tidbits and stuff like that. So come follow me on there as well. If you had any questions or had any feedback about today's show, you can always email me. It'll be in my little outro. It's, um, it's, Java with Jen podcast at gmail.com. And then you can, of course, go to the blog and I'll be posting some fun little video pictures and videos from today's interview with Crystal and some of our mermaiding stuff I'll put on there. So you can go over there for a fun little couple minutes of entertainment. My uh, blog is wordpress.com slash, wait. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Generally, Samuel.wordpress.com. That might actually be it. Oh, shoot. I think it's in the outro. <laughs> Listen to the outro. Anyway, so come find the blog. Follow me on Instagram. Go follow Crystal on Instagram. So until next time, thanks so much for tuning in. This has been Java with Jen. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. It really means a lot to me. And don't forget, you can always email me with questions or comments at javawithjenpodcast at gmail.com. And for links or show notes, just go visit my blog at jennaleesamuel.wordpress.com. Until next time, you've got this and God's got you.